Welcome to SDA Mastery, the podcast series hosted by Tanya Gomez Consulting. In each episode, we'll be sharing valuable insights and tips that can help you learn the intricacies of specialist disability accommodation. We will demystify the entire SDA process, give you direct access to experts in the field, and help you to discover what life is like as an SDA provider. Whether you're thinking about leaping into SDA or you're looking to level up your existing NDIS business, you're in the right place. Come on in. Let's explore the SDA space together. Welcome to SDA Mastery. Today we are talking to Angad Singh from Nirvana Lifestyles, all about the future of SDA. Yes, had a big review drop just we, at the end of last year, haven't we? We have, yes. And you've been talking about it far and wide. Mm-hmm. And I believe you have some opinions mm-hmm. about what's going to happen for everybody next. Yeah, I do. I mean, obviously, they're all speculation. And I think that more broadly, I yes. think we have some ideas of what this might mean for SDA. Mm-hmm. And I actually think I'm very optimistic about the impacts on SDA, which yeah. seems to be unusual compared to what some of the other people have interpreted from the review. Yeah, I've, I've heard a lot of... Um, fear, but I think change, any, any change Always comes with fear, fear right? Yeah. I think that people who work in government regulated spaces just need to really understand that the only thing they can be certain on is that it's going to change. Yes. A million times it's going to yeah. change. And that's the responsibility of the government really yeah. to make sure they're continuing improving the scheme and, and keeping it. Uh, this is why I'm actually quite happy with the reviews and the reports that have come out and all the changes that have been made today mm. because none of them have been surprising. Yeah. Okay. If it was like a bouncy ball jumping around and you could never predict what was happening. Mm. It would be very, I wouldn't be an SDA. I'd be like, it's too scary, yeah. it's too volatile, I'm not interested. But everything is directionally aligned, I feel. And every recommendation and everything that they're trying to say is consistent with their vision. So it feels like there's no changes per se. There's just better guardrails to execute what they were planning from the beginning. That's how, that's how I see these changes and reviews, which is why I guess I'm getting confidence not um, pessimism from, yeah. the, from the reviews. So on that vein then, what about the removal of the IEL category? Because the last price review increased IEL by, I want to say, 160%, yes. but yep. now a different review is saying maybe we're not going to have IEL. That seems contradictory. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's contradictory at all. Um, let's break those things down because they're not the same, right? When they price SDA property, mm. if NDI could waive a wand, yep. every single SDA investor would get the same return on money. That's their goal. It's about okay. 12%. It's documented in their pricing methodology. The reason IL funding increased was because they recognized that the cost of IL was understated. Okay. And through the correction of that, the, the rates went up, right? It wasn't a direct thing about IL. It was actually an acknowledgement that the cost of an IL versus HBS is not as different as we thought, which right. is true. Okay. Right? They've still got some things wrong. Don't get me wrong. Like, you know, but that was what they were doing was that, which is, the, again, the right thing mm-hmm. because that's how they told you they would price SDA mm-hmm. based on a cost base and they have their methodology and they followed their methodology and this is what came out of it. Now, there's also something in the NDIA, in the vision, about reasonable and necessary and value for money. Mm-hmm. Right? When you see the new pricing and you recognize that there is basically no difference in funding between an IL and an FA and clearly those are not the same houses, yeah. you must become skeptical yeah, about okay. why, why do we have – the same funding for two products when one should clearly be a higher level of care. Right? And so because they're closer together, then the recommendation was, well, why don't we just, I think when they said that, you read it with the other recommendations as well, I think they mean that if someone's eligible for IL, they should just go straight into FA. Right. They don't need a separate category to cover that. Um, although they did then recommend an additional category to, yeah. to enter into the piece, mm-hmm. which I think will become similar to what is currently IL. And there seems to be some flexible, well, this is the suggestion of increased flexibility of how people use their funding in accommodation. How do you think that will impact SDA? Yeah, this is, again, directionally consistent with choice and control. If you look at every major capital city, housing is a massive priority for individuals, right? They, they spend anywhere from 60% on housing, right? 60% of their income goes to housing. Do you know how much the SDA budget is in the NDI, like, do you know what percentage of it's the, tiny, right? it's like not 60%? even half, a, not even no, half a percent. No, it's t- like 350 million. The seal budget is 8.8 billion. Yeah. Just the seal. It's so small. Um, that's partially because it doesn't, it's only for a very small amount of people, but it's also relatively, you know, people make a choice. I don't want to eat out twice a week. I'd rather spend, have a, live in a nicer area. Yeah. These, these are decisions that people are allowed to make. Yeah. And I think that allowing people to do that in SDAs 
is directionally consistent with choice and control. Yeah, I, I, I really like your viewpoint on that. It's very, uh, it's very refreshing to hear such a positive outcome from a government review. Yeah, <laughs> I've heard though there's a lot of uncertainty for investors because of of changes and people who had potentially IL projects in the pipeline are now uncertain about that. Yeah, have you come across that, and how would you manage that? Now, we've done some IL projects. I understand what it is, right? What's probably not going to happen is they're not going to terminate IELT tomorrow and then it's, it's done, right? However, when the last review came out in June, we, when the IELT budget went up by 160%, we stopped doing IELT. Okay. Which was the opposite of what everyone did. Why? So you, you've got to remember this competition element. The, the dynamic of the SDA market before was that someone who had a HPS house and they built a HPS, which is now a beautiful house, big house, all of this, would not accept an IELT participant because their funding was too low. Mm. So what would happen is this HPS houses would sit empty and IELTS would go into IEL houses. Mm. The second that funding, that gap between IEL and HPS closed to a point that an investor would take an IEL participant into their HPS any day of the week. No. Which means if you build IEL, your competition is HPS houses. Still. Now you have to recognize that the bar has shifted. Mm. You are not, the only reason we would do IEL is because the location is an absolute ripper and it's impossible to do mm. FA HPS. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I, like, I saw that review and I said, look, now all of the supply risk of HPS is now basically it's going to get absorbed by the IL. Right. And now anyone's looking is basically going to have a, a buffet of options mm. and you're going to be IL, FA, HPS. From the perspective of the investor, it won't matter because okay. they're all good outcomes. Mm. So how do you be the best? Because remember, there's a flight to quality element that we spoke about in the previous mm. interview. Yep. So again, I, it confuses me that someone could come to the opposite opinion like view that's saying oh well let's only do IL now because the but it just seems very short-sighted right it does but for me price drives behavior and so when I saw that the price had gone up yes. I'm thinking that they have increased it so that more people develop it because obviously they know uh -huh, there's a demand perfect. there this is to the nub of it you know what I mean like this is such a good point that you're raising I think I'm not sure how many people have actually read the pricing methodology of SDA. And if you haven't read it, you should read it because it is, it. <laughs> look, if you're an SDA developer, yeah. frankly, and you haven't read it, uh, you're missing an enormous, enormous piece of the puzzle. Okay. It is abundantly clear that in that methodology, what they do is they assess costs, they apply a weighted average capital rate of return, and they back calculate what the return needs to be for an investor to achieve a target return. Mm. It is not telling you what to build. It is not signaling demand. It is not signaling supply. It is not doing any of that. There has been some commentary that maybe it should. Mm. However, uh, the location factors is another example. Mm. Yeah, People think that a high location factor means high demand, not true. Just the margin needed to develop in that yeah, area. So, so what they've essentially done is they take an SA4 area, which is a massive statistical area, by the way, and they take an average land value and say, well, that's for the purpose of the model. That's what the land value is in this SA4 area. Let's add the build it. That's what the return is. Right. This is obviously wacky because it creates ridiculous, like, if you don't know how well everyone knows Perth, but let's look at Perth, right? You go five, seven Ks northeast of Perth, you hit Nolamara, Balga, Westminster, very quite affordable areas, right? And then you go further out, you get the Swan Valley, you know, Ellenbrook and all of those things, which are not the cheapest areas. They're not too bad, right? Uh, then you go southeast, which is the highest location factor in, in WA, right? Three to five Ks out, five, seven Ks, you hit Applecross, you know, some of the richest suburbs in, in, in Perth. You go 25 k's out, now you're in Armidale, Hilbert, Haynes, Gosnells, which are far cheaper than those same suburbs in the northeast, but they have a much higher location factor. Mm. What do you think every investor's doing? Yeah, going to the but, highest area. Correct. Get away. From, like, don't do that because everyone else is doing that. Yeah. It's not a signal that that's where they need product. Like, you should like, pretty much ignore the location factor, except when you come to the figuring out the returns. But, like, for the sake of knowing whether something is a good location, the location factor tells you basically nothing. So then how do you find out where you build your property? At, at the moment, we're a bit lucky in Perth in that there's always, there seems to be still plenty of demand if you've got a good product and all this. We essentially have a panel of SDA providers, five of them, and we just touch base with them every fortnight, every month. How are you going? Where are you getting your inquiry? How many leads on your Facebook ads are you getting? Those kinds of questions. And we're trying our best to apply that on top of first principles of residential real estate quality of like scarcity of location, quality, outlook, amenity, infrastructure, all of the basics overlaid with feedback from an SDA provider. Now, the data coming out of the NDI is pretty, 
T useless. No, it's not completely useless, but it's it's one of the things that I don't pay an enormous amount of attention to. Yeah, and, okay. and the reason for that is this, right? I know for a fact in an area that we're currently developing, it says there's like three robust participants in the entire SA3 area. Mm. Not as big as an SA4, but still plenty big. Three participants apparently. I know a SDA provider in that location with 40 people in-house in inappropriate accommodation right now. Yeah. So it doesn't add up. There's probably a reason that they haven't disclosed that they have these participants because they don't want to lose them, mm. right? So there's a bit of that client capture in the review, which is a true phenomenon, which the location in itself is actually, um, it's a piece of the puzzle, but it's not the only piece. If you have an SDA provider, for example, they might be very good at a location and then be completely useless in another location because they don't have boots on the ground. We're trying to identify a location, which is good from just first principles of residential, identify a provider who's got a track record and demonstrated demand. And that's how we choose our locations. It's those two factors as the primary factors. It's market intelligence. It's, it's yeah. knowing the market. It's knowing what's out yeah. there. It's somewhat still boots on the ground yeah, it, presence. It feels very scrappy, like calling SDA providers and asking them, how many Facebook leads did you get this week? And I think like, it sounds really Those smart. kinds of things. <laughs> but that's, that's, to be honest, what I find is the best source of information. Yeah. I mean, all the, the, the data mm. um, is either too old or, or just clearly wrong. Yeah. yeah. So what's your view on the recommendation around moving the pricing of SDA to an independent pricing regulator? I think it's a good thing. This came out of the Age Commission had to do the same review as the NDIS, right, because they have a similar system. Ultimately, they're similar products, mm. aged care and disability homes, they're similar products, but the process is the same. Why would you have two different departments handling it? It makes no sense. Combine intel, combine research, combine data, skills, talent. It's so you think it's just cost savings? You don't think it's a, a representation or a reflection of the job that the NGIS has done on the pricing of SDA? It's not saying they've yeah. done a bad job, so we're moving it to someone else. Um, it's just saying that we could save costs. Yes. For the so even if the NDI had done a good job, I think they should still consolidate. Mm. They should still consolidate into one department mm. for, for that type of for, thing. For best right? value. For best value and also best outcomes. Like mm. It's actually really hard to do this type of work. And now you've just done all this type of work for aged care, this will have, or, or disability, it'll be very closely correlated to, dis, to aged care mm. because the products are similar. They're still using the same bricks. Do you get what I mean? Like, so they're not so different that they should be different departments. Yeah, right. So I think consolidating him in and of itself is a good idea. The subject of whether the NDI did a good job mm. is a separate question. Yeah. And I'm, I, you know, we can speak to that if you like. Um, yeah, okay. So was there anything in the review that did make you worry? You seem overly optimistic about it all. I'm not worry per se. I'm to be like I'm probably generally optimistic, and I'm very paranoid about supply risk in SDA because I see I see people doing things that I don't think is a good idea. But you know, you see the the Excel spreadsheet, and it makes a million dollars, and it's great, right? Not not understanding the competition element that you must overlay over any business that you have. So there was nothing really. Like I said, everything in that review, and and I'm. More focus on the SDA stuff. The SEAL stuff, I'm not as close to SEAL as SDA, right? Nothing in the review was, uh, I feel, directionally inconsistent or something that I wouldn't have predicted that they would do. Yeah. Not understanding, understanding their vision, which I think they've articulated very clearly. Mm -hmm. The most exciting things, I think, were the introduction of the new category, mm -hmm. the mandatory separation of SEAL and SDA, which mm -hmm. I think will, if not double, like, if not triple, at least double the SDA pool, mm -hmm. um, create a whole new range of things and, and expand that market um, significantly. So why do you think that? Why do you think it'll expand that market? So right now, if you look at SDA, SDA is covers about 3.5 or 3.8%, I think, of the NDIS participant. When they contemplated SDA, and you can tell this from their design guidelines, they had a vision that people that were needed accommodation in order to facilitate care would have some sort of accommodation support, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what their vision was, and you can tell this by the way that the guidelines are written and some of the, the other things that they've said. And then they launched the SDA and they set the bar for SDA incredibly high, right? Such that some of the design guidelines and requirements don't even make sense. I'll give you an example. Could you ever imagine someone that needs extreme, that has extreme functional impairment or very high support needs, which is necessary to get access to SDA funding, ever being suitable for dwelling without an OA? So why would SDA even contemplate dwellings without OA? It makes no sense, right? Until you understand that. Informal supports, living in the family. Yeah. I think actually what it was is they thought that there'd be more people that would get SDA. Right. Because there's definitely more people that need accommodation than that right. have just been covered by SDA, right. right? So I think originally they were thinking that maybe there'd be some people that 
have drop in supports or whatever and can live largely independently, but have drop in support. I think uh, what's happened in the marketplace, which you probably know more about than I do, is you get this cohort of people, which is SDA, the top 3.8%. You probably get three times that many people or four times that many people that need accommodation and they go into still housing. Mm -hmm. That's where they're going right now. That is, in the view of the NDIA, a bad thing because it creates client capture, conflicts of interest, too much control, all of those things, right? That will now be in the wheelhouse of SDA, which is at probably three times more than the pool. I mean, again, you probably know more about the data. They don't publish this data. Even if you just took the people that need 24-7 support in, yep. the, in the previous review, I think that's still double. But I'm not sure that should be the bar for getting some support and accommodation because if someone needs active support for 16 hours, not 18 hours a day, or passive support, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. I still think that there would be a strong case for some sort of accommodation support. Mm. So, yeah, that's that's what I think. I think it's going to it's going to be maybe even five times as big as what the current SDA market is. And that's because you imagine that those sill homes are going to be purpose built for those participants, and there will be a housing element needed to house those sill participants, as opposed to the current use of rental property. Yes, um, uh, there's a few things. So. Do I think that sh the new category, shared living, will effectively replace sill homes? Yes. I think yeah. that is very deliberately the intention yeah. and very explicitly stated. Um, although uh, sill housing is not a, not a thing in the end. It's not a thing, yeah. right? So they don't refer to it, but yeah. very clearly. Daily task shared living. Because it's not mandated by the NDIA as a sill, mm. sill housing, they don't talk about it. But that's what they're referring to when they're saying people yeah. are living in these houses controlled by care providers. So yes, I do think that it's inappropriate. Not just the fact there's a conflict of interest, but the houses suck. Yeah. Have you seen? Have yes. you seen? <laughs> it's it's atrocious. Yes. Um, do yeah. I think that those should be purpose built so they can provide a standard of care that is acceptable? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, do they need to be new? Maybe not. Do the standards need to be at the level of HPS? Probably not. Mm. Um, More robust. Well, I, I think I think IL is probably the the thing. And in fact, I would say IL, but there should be one. There should be mandatory that one bathroom is a, is is FA HPS. Okay. So at least, because they may not need it every day, but yeah. then if they need a specific thing, like once a week or, you know, sometimes people might have a bad day yeah. and they need to be in a wheelchair for a day. Like that, this happens. It's not like yeah, yeah. they're at the same level forever, yeah, right? Correct. So on that day, if they need help having a shower, maybe they can go into the accessible bathroom. But on every other day, they can just use their own shower, mm. right? Mm. So yeah, absolutely. I think that that type of housing should be taken as seriously as SDA. Um, and the standards should be from a human perspective, should be the same. They, they may not have the same needs, they may not need the same spec, but yeah, I think we should be caring about the people <laughs> the same way. Yeah, Yeah. no, I agree. I just hadn't seen it that way. Again, yeah. you've read the review very differently, different yeah, eyes, okay. right? I read it from an auditor's perspective that's highly suspicious of different things. Okay. And I see it a little bit differently. So it's really interesting to get your view. And I think next time that there's a review, I'll be calling you to yeah. take over and get your, yeah, get your views. Well, up. I'd love to know, what, what do you think about that? What yeah, look, I, I think I think the review was heavily around no group accommodation. Yes. The, the idea of group living. I think there's a lot of calls there about using the budget flexibly for me really is is more around this move. So in an in a a SIL person's plan now, we've got a SIL budget, but then the SIL budget's either too much or too little, so they fall into their other funding. And so the flexibility of being able to use your funding as you need it, yeah. I think that's really positive. Yeah. And I think it's what's needed because because currently um, a lot of the DSP is used or other funding is used that should be used for therapy or should be used for community access is being used to subsidise the housing because the housing element isn't high enough. Yes. I had read into it that they'd made a, a mistake about increasing the price, price of IEL, but I really like your explanation there that it's, it's less about, it's just that it hasn't been priced correctly in the first instance and it's because the product is different, it needs to be charged differently. Yeah. That makes sense. I wonder in that though about robust because to me robust isn't isn't priced enough and if I look at the clients in SIL or that, that I support, robust is the thing that's missing. Yes. Robust is not seen anywhere. So I wonder where is robust in all of this? Yes. And it, 
in my head, it's almost broken down by people with physical disabilities versus people with intellectual or um, uh, complex behaviours yeah. because robust is really for complex behaviours as opposed to HBS being around facilitating extra width for physical disabilities. For a human rights advocate, I go, well, why are people with mental health issues not being given the same level of funding? And I don't have never built anything. But for me, it's like, okay, we're giving extra funding for IL, but what about robust? Why yeah. have we forgotten robust? Yeah. Where's that gone? It's a mistake. Frankly, they did say this in the pricing review in okay. June or July. Yeah. They said that they didn't know. They suggested that there should be a limited review on this because it's very different. Yeah. Right? The problem with Robust, if you've got your prediction hat on, you've just predicted that Robust is underpriced and will likely increase. Yeah. So what would you be designing and developing robust. right now? I would be anyway because yeah. I think so, it's where the need is. Absolutely. So we have, this is what we're doing. Yeah. Right? We have seven in construction. I can't sell it to investors because the returns are not high enough yeah. for what you've said, but I'm happy to hold them for myself because it's still pretty good. Yeah. And I do believe you'll get a kicker. Yeah. The problem with Robust is if you read the design guidelines for Robust, you learn nothing about what to build. What is a robust material? You know, there's no, there's no spec to it. It doesn't have an impact resistance or a noise, you know, sound insulated in the bedrooms. What does that mean? Okay. So what is robust construction? <laughs> Nobody actually knows yet. Yeah. We're making it up as we go. What's been recognized is that we don't understand. We need to spec robust like specifically enough that people can actually can do it. it. We discussed with our SDA providers. We came up with our own spec based on what our conversation with seal providers and, and a few other things. And then the SDA assessors saying, Hey, listen, if we use an acoustic maxi brick with plaster of size, is that going to be soundproofed? Yeah, is yeah. that enough? That'll work. Like yeah. we're making it up as we go. Yeah. Um, so there needs to be standards developed on what is a robust look like to drive that. The first thing is you that. must first develop a program. Thank you for joining us on this episode of SDA Mastery by Tanya Gomez Consulting. We hope you found this episode helpful and valuable. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, leave us a rating and share it with others. Until next time, keep learning. I think that why, the, the more crazy thing is that the robust maintenance is the same as HPS maintenance, yeah. which, is, which yeah. is nuts. Yeah. And maybe the other thing is, like, if you look, if you talk to any SDA provider, seal provider, et cetera, right, they will tell you that there is only one viable typology, maybe two, one viable typology for robust. Apartments are out of the question, mm -hmm. which you know, it's not even a category for it. People need to live alone or with a large amount of separation. Mm -hmm. So what you either have is a single participant villa. Yeah. Or a very large house with two participants, but essentially separate. So on that basis, there's no single participant house in yeah. robust. There needs to be, mm. right? And and probably robust in terms of the spectrum of needs that you get, it's enormous, mm. right? You get someone who's you know might have a forensic house need, and someone who's might have an episode every now and then. So it's it's a very big range. I think they need to get clarity on it and absolutely price it. I suspect maybe a fifty to 80% increase in robust is appropriate. Yeah. Okay. Based on what I know about costs. Well, that, that sits well with me. I like that. I could talk to you all day about this, um, but I think we will leave it here for today. Thank pleasure. you so much for no, joining thank you me. Very much. Always so wonderful to hear your thoughts. And when um, we get some confirmations, you'll be yeah. my first phone call. Yeah. Let's uh, let's have a look at the, the next review and we'll, we'll have a chat about it. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us on this episode of SDA Mastery by Tanya Gomez Consulting. We hope you found this episode helpful and valuable. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, leave us a rating and share it with others. Until next time, keep learning.